Hi, everybody, and welcome to another exciting adventure in podcasting. This is Words, Images, and Worlds, and delighted on this episode to be joined by comics creator, and I'll also add actor. I believe you're you're in the world of acting as well, um, Steve Matson. Steve, thank you for jumping on and joining. Uh, happy to be here, Jason. Thank you very much for inviting me. Yeah, my pleasure. My pleasure. I'll mention a couple of titles that are some of my favorites that you've worked on. And then, of course, we can come back around because I know that the things that have stood out to me might not be your favorites. So i um, love to give you the chance to talk about some of your best experiences, too. But, of course, um, Black Panther being one of those. Green Lantern, you did a, a rather extensive run on green lantern as i recall and uh i'm a huge batman fan so batman seduction of the gun was also a title that was uh very big for me growing up as well yeah um black panther panther's prey by uh don mcgregor was very exciting to work on because uh, i read that his black panther panther's rage mm -hmm. was a kid and just loved his work and it's very exciting to contribute to that world. And then when they used a lot of uh, Dawn stuff in the movie, it was, it was very exciting to see. Yeah, yeah. Great story. Um, great storyline and just a, a great character as well. Um, so so what was it about comics that drew you in as a creator? How did they capture your attention? Well, as a, as a kid in grade school, I did a lot of reading. I liked to... Uh, Encyclopedia Brown that led me to Tom Swift Jr., led me to Edgar Rice Burroughs, which led me to Tolkien. Mm -hmm. And uh, the first day of my seventh grade English class, the teacher said, hey, on Fridays, I want you guys to bring in stuff and we're going to read all period long. I don't care what you read. It can even be comic books. <laughs> There's just something in the tone of her voice, a little condescending. Right, I right. prepared to bring in The Hobbit, but uh, I went to the 7-Eleven with the spinner rack. Same 7-Eleven where I bought my uh, baseball cards and started looking at the comic book titles because that's what I was going to bring in. Mm -hmm. And a couple caught my eye. One was uh, Justice League number 101 and the other was uh, Brave and Bold 104. It's a Batman Green Arrow team up with uh, them fighting Two-Face. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And those two comic books really led me in. Uh, Justice League 101 made me want to read comics and Brave and Bold 104 made me want to do them. It was a, yeah. just this amazing combination. Yeah. yeah. Curious about the path from there, from the spinner racks to actually creating. Were there um, particularly kind people along the way that mentored you and experiences like that that stand out? Absolutely. But uh, the, the path to get to there was, was just a little bit longer because uh, Justice League 101 was the second part of a three-part story so i had to start haunting the spinner racks to find 103 to find out how it ended and then i had to find mm -hmm. out about comic book shops to get 100 to find where it started and when you're looking through comic book shops for justice league 100 there's all kinds of other stuff you find and when you're <laughs> haunting the spinner racks for 103 all kinds of other stuff you can find and that's what really made me want to read them um but Brave and Bold 104 was by an artist named Jim Aparo, mm -hmm. and his stuff looked different than everybody else's. It's like uh, it's, he's had such a spontaneous line, but it kind of coalesced into this realistic style. It's like, how does he do that? Mm -hmm. And so that uh, made me explore. It's like, how, how can you do comics? This yeah. is a guy who's drawing it. Everything else looked a little cookie cutter to me. This looked a, very individual. So you know, I find it out, found out about uh, writers and pencilers and inkers and letterers and colorists and all that and the different breakdowns and stuff. And, and I started, uh, you know, working up samples and going to local comic book conventions. And you asked about kind people. They, mm -hmm. they were very nice people, but there's also ones that told you to it, told you what the way it was. It's like, mm -hmm. hey, you know, you're not good enough. Yeah, keep working on this. Figure this out. Work on this. And as time went by, it's like they really liked my coloring. I said, hey, you know what? This is better than the colorists I've got at DC or Marvel. Uh, you know, keep working on this and show your samples around. And so then I started heading that direction. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, anything that you'd like to speak to about the role of the colorist in comics? Because um, 
unless you're in the industry or unless you've spent a lot of time in comics, listeners might not fully appreciate everything that a colorist brings to the page. Yeah, you're you're part of the storytelling team. The mm-hmm. writer writes the script, the penciler follows those directions, the inker gives you the look of the finished art, but the the colorist has a lot to do with that as well. You can really emphasize and de-emphasize certain aspects of the art depending on what the story needs, uh, where to focus in the panel. Mm-hmm. You try to add depth of field, like lighter colors fade back, darker colors come forward. Mm-hmm. Details come forward more, um, you know, less softer focus stuff goes back. So if you want something really to pop, you'd use dark colors and put a lot of modeling and shading on that. That would pop forward less color, lighter values start fading back. And so it Mm -hmm. depends on what needs to be emphasized in the panel. Yeah, yeah. And there's a a complex structure to it, I know, of like, isn't there a number system that goes with coloring too and um, that sort of process side of it as well? Yeah, so way back in the day, um, you know, you could only use black, magenta, cyan, and yellow. You had to make all the colors out of those and the different percentages of each of those colors would then make, you know, brown or Superman red or, or what have you. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. It's kind of fun way back when Marvel had a real formula of the um, superheroes had to be in primary colors, mm-hmm. the villains, secondary colors, <laughs> and the tertiary colors were browns and grays. So you could always tell who the good guy and bad guy was. And so if you want to know, you know, the, the Hulk was green with purple pants. Those are secondary colors. Samara <laughs> had green shorts. He was the, those were bad guys when they first started. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. If you knew what the code was, you knew. <laughs> Almost like its own story beneath the surface. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, so any projects that stand out? You mentioned Black Panther as being an especially positive one, but other titles or projects that you um, look back on fondly now. Well, I want to go back to one of the questions you asked about um, meeting some kind people and yes, you know, yeah. mentoring you along the way. Um, I got really lucky. Um, I was planning to uh, move to New York to break into comics. Right about the same time, several things happened. Federal Express got up and going, and uh, artists were able to move back home and send their work to New York. They didn't have to drop it off. And so... Uh, Paul Galassi, who had been one of my favorites, he drew Master of Kung Fu about Mm -hmm. the same time Panther's Rage was coming out. He had moved to Portland and I'd heard about it. And so I sent him a letter, you know, snail mail. And he answered and said, yeah, come on over and, you know, check out my studio. So I went over there and kind of hanging out. And he said, hey, Steve, I think you may know my wife. And it was uh, just coincidentally, uh, she was a cheerleader on every uh, middle school and high school football team I was on. Uh, <laughs> she'd gone to New York to fashion school. They had met and moved back here to her, her hometown. And so at an end with Paul Galassi and got to work as his, uh, you know, background assistant, um, actually did a lot of modeling for him. So a lot of those Paul Galassi covers were based on pictures of me, which is kind of fun. That is cool. That is very cool. The so universe I, I just coalesces. Paul. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was really great. And, um, <laughs> Another guy who moved back to Portland was uh, Ron Randall, who's drawing Trekker now. Mm-hmm. And uh, he was one of the first uh, in one of the first classes at the Kubert School. And I went to uh, the same grade school, junior high and high school as he did. But he was just far enough ahead of me. I'd never met him. But it was it was enough in common that I, I got in with Ron as well and colored covers for him and stuff. So that was sweet. And nice. then the other thing that happened all at the same time is Dark Horse Comics started up here in Portland, Oregon. And I just went and started hanging out in their office. And, and Dark Horse get rid of me. Presents. Yeah. There was no uh, there was no job interview or anything. I just came in and didn't leave. <laughs> and so they said, uh, give this guy some work, some yeah, Dark we Horse did. presents or something. Okay. <laughs> all kinds of all kinds of production stuff behind the scenes and and coloring. And then they needed fill-ins for Dark Horse Presents, mm-hmm. four six page stories and fill-ins on Boris the Bear, which is their other title. They only had two to begin with. And that led to more. Love it. Love it. Yeah. 
Um, so I think the the next place I was going to go was those projects that you look back on fondly and um, think about as, as those that sort of bubble to the top. Uh, had a, a really great time working with Carl Kiesel, um, who's actually a neighbor. Uh, and we did, um, I did a few fill-in issues of Superboy with him, and then we co-created Superboy and the Ravers, which lasted for a couple of years. Um, it was just so much fun, uh, you know, creating a lot of the characters from scratch and integrating them into the DC universe and figuring out, you know, hey, hey, what characters can we play with? What characters would we want to create new? It was just a uh, it's just really satisfying for someone who want, wanted to get in there and uh, you know, make his mark on the DC universe. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, Carl was on, um, I want to say late spring, early summer. So uh, yeah. Talking about impossible Jones. If people yes. should check that out. It's a terrific comic. It really is. It really is. Absolutely. And I met him at heroes con a couple of years ago as well. So glad to have someone else from the neighborhood on the yeah, pod absolutely. as well. Yeah. 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 Um, so final official question, and then All we right. can hit anything that we've missed. Um, I promised you a brief talk, but glad sure. to, to spend time on anything that you'd like to. And that is um, the next things that are happening in your creative journey, the things that you're currently thinking about. And I always like to ask about spaces where people can connect if they want to follow along, um, kind of look look at what you're doing and look at what you've done and uh, be aware of appearances and things like that. Sure. Appreciate that. So um, one of the nerd things I'm still kind of deeply involved in is I uh, contribute to a Buckaroo Banzai fanzine. Nice. Uh, year, nice. Yeah. You, you know, Buckaroo. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Next year's the 40th anniversary of the movie and the 25th anniversary of our fanzine. We just had an issue come out uh, last week that focused on the African-American cast and crew of, of the movie. Really happy with the way it turned out. Next year, we'll do something exciting for the, the twin anniversaries. But you can find that on the World Watch One Facebook page. Nice, nice. So, yeah, check that out. You can download links to the 25 years of Buckaroo Banzai fanzines. And then you, you mentioned I, uh, I kind of dabbled in acting. Um, you can check out my IMDB page, and that's Steve okay. Matson with two T's and two S's. Uh, slow down a little bit from COVID and the actor strike, but hopefully it'll it'll pick up here in a little bit. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm sending all the good vibes for the actor strike and um, fair practices and things like that. Um, so absolutely, um, and sending good vibes for that to be back on the upswing as well well i think uh people love content so it's it's going to come back yes absolutely Hopefully everybody get a fair deal absolutely agreed agreed um well steve thank you so much did we miss anything that you want to make sure to share about oh another uh great collaboration i had was with uh james dean smith he was the artist on boris the bear uh -huh. um, uh -huh. you know it lasted a year at dark horse and was kind of a a parody of current happenings in the comic book industry. And uh, James wanted to take it a different way. And so he started self-publishing after uh, the 12 issues from Dark Horse and, you know, did a more of a slice of life adventure kind of thing. And uh, we had our own two-man comic book company for, for several years there. And uh, just so much fun going to conventions, promoting the book, uh, you know, doing everything, typesetting the letters columns, uh, pasting up the covers, all that stuff. This was all pre-computer uh, press and stuff. So uh, mm -hmm. just uh, it was a labor of love. And Jim was a, a great guy to deal with. Very cool. Very cool. And I, I have a lot of appreciation for um, Dark Horse just because it was such a a wonderful find in the midst of DC and Marvel in the late 80s, early 90s to continue to get to read more comics and kind of branch out from there. Uh, and really enjoy kind of the the different approaches in storytelling there as well. Yeah, Mike Richardson, who uh, started the company, was a comic book retailer and had uh, real strong ideas about what kind of titles he wanted to see, what he thought would be able to sell. Mm -hmm. And uh, Boris was sort of a, a commercial success for him that kind of rallied against the black and white explosion and the glut of comics. And then Dark Horse Presents was really more of a critical uh, success for him with really top end writers and artists that he had worked with over the years. And um, so that one, two punch of the commercial and critical success 
kind of launched him. And his philosophy was only to print comic books that he wanted to read himself. He and Randy Stradley did a really nice job. Yeah, yeah. And Dark Horse Presents was really, in a lot of ways, the anthology nature of it, to me, kind of harkened back to like EC Comics and, you know, getting three or four stories in one um, 22 or 20, however many pages uh, of comic book space. So uh, really interesting series. Yeah, I love that kind of thing. It really gave it, it gave me the impression of more value for your money. You got oh, I got three different artists to check mm-hmm. out, three different mm-hmm. characters. This is this is great. So I, I always love those kinds of things. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, I appreciate your work in, in that world as well as with the big two, and uh, you know, generally in the world of storytelling. And looking forward to sharing this, and we'll be glad to have you back anytime. Well, thank you very much, Jason. It was a lot of fun. Appreciate it. Yeah, great to talk with you, and thanks so much. Okay.